Hello, welcome to this week's Dividend Cafe. We're, uh, we're trying a kind of new setting here this week. I um, am recording from my office in Newport Beach, but uh, when I was in New York this summer, they actually installed a whole studio deal, and so you get to see kind of this the backdrop, and we think it looks a little nicer. The main thing for me is that from time to time, uh, CNBC or Fox or uh, Bloomberg will call and ask to have me on on a particular topic and now I can literally jump out of my chair at my desk and sit right here and they hit a couple buttons and I'm, I'm live on air. So it's real, real easy, low maintenance, doesn't take any time for me, which is kind of nice. But yeah, we'll probably start recording our Friday Dividend Cafes here. And um, speaking of Dividend Cafe, I'm kind of doing something this week a little different. Um, I've had a little bit of feedback from some of the people that, that listen to the video, but not necessarily um, uh, read the written Dividend Cafe every week, that they feel a little... Uh, left out because oftentimes I refer to the things I'm writing about in Divin Cafe and not necessarily covering in this weekly. So I'm gonna, I've kind of printed out the Divin Cafe. I'm going to try to walk through a couple of the the supplemental points that we get into in the written commentary this week. But I'm going to start off talking about the major point that we lead in the written Divin Cafe as well. It's a it's a very important theme in understanding what's driving markets right now, and that is. This uh, concept, pardon the big word, but global synchronicity. Another way of saying it is the global alignment, and obviously we mean positive alignment, um, that is taking place across economies and, of course, stock markets. Uh, it is absolutely the exception, not the rule, in terms of what is historically the norm. The reality is, is that right now we are in an incredibly odd period. Uh, positive GDP growth for virtually every economy developed and emerging in the world. And, and there is some degree of central bank coordination behind some of that. There are still at this point very accommodative central banks around the world, but um, they are divergent in direction in some cases. I refer to the idea here in, in the United States that our bank is still, our Fed is still very accommodative. Um, but headed towards normalization. So we can't quite call it tightening yet when we have a 1% federal funds rate and a over $4 trillion Fed balance sheet, yet they are headed towards reducing the balance sheet and they indeed have already slowly begun to normalize interest rates. Um, in Europe, Japan, uh, etc., they're in a different place. So I actually think the synchronicity is mostly around a reflation theme. More industrial production, some higher commodity prices, uh, higher, um, uh, shall we say, growth-oriented economic achievement. Now, in some cases, it's very underwhelming. You look at Italy and France, for example, um, but a more robust pickup in, in Germany. And, and even in the weaker countries in Europe, it's off the zero bound where it had been most of last year and year before and so forth. Um, so on one hand, this is a very valid explanation of the health of markets. 43% of sales in the S&P 500 take place outside the United States. Uh, there is a sense in which we can see why the appetite for risk assets is higher when this kind of globally coordinated positive backdrop with low inflation exists. The only thing I would add is that you have to see the risk in the other side of it. Um, I do not believe that U.S. bond yields are staying as stubbornly low as they are merely because of low inflation expectation and obviously because of Federal Reserve activity, which has much less control over the 10-year yield than they do the short term. When we see interest rates this low, even in a backdrop of some reasonable economic activity, I think it's a byproduct of global rates that the U.S. bond yields are unable to break out much higher when the German bond yields are practically at zero. Same story, Japan and other countries. So to the extent that this global synchronicity is, is alive and well, should Mario Draghi and the ECB begin their own path to normalization as he's somewhat forecasted? Should European yields move higher? 
I fully expect it would pull U.S. yields up as well. I don't necessarily see that as totally unhealthy, but it would definitely change the backdrop and the kind of free ride that risk assets are getting right now. It's a major theme in what we're evaluating uh, on a macro level across the market right now. And, and again, that we write about it quite a bit in Dividend Cafe. There's a little fun economics lesson this week. I, I call it the zero bound risk free rate. But essentially what I'm saying is that, uh, look, we, we all know that, um, that interest rates around zero uh, have have been very good for risk assets. Uh, it's a low cost of money, and nobody is uh, really bemoaned that. But there is a uh, another side to it that has to be understood. The risk premium then comes down as well. The expected return of assets that drive their return from the premium they offer above the risk free rate is lower when that risk free rate is lower. And, and I think that this is something that um, we have to kind of appreciate if we believe any degree of normalization is going to come in. It does not necessarily mean, because we don't know of all the different variables, how it will play out, it does, that it, it could create an overnight bear market and things of that nature. But it does mean something that I think is important, and that is a longer term deterioration of the expected return. Of, of certain risk asset classes. And, and I think that that um, uh, needs to be played in not only to investor expectation, but also to asset allocation and to the tactical maneuvering that one may do um, as they seek to, to balance risk and reward characteristics to create a given investor outcome. Uh, there, when I say economics lesson, another kind of longer portion in the written report, I'll move it along here. Um, but it has to do with this aftermath of Hurricane Harvey and Irma and these awful situations uh, in Texas and Florida, and we continue to be praying for the recovery efforts there and, and, and thankful that the, the severe weather conditions have ended, but now recognize an awful lot of work has to be done. But yeah, it is unfortunate. There's been quite a bit of economic commentary. I don't real. I should be putting that in air quotes because I don't believe it is worthy of the term about the benefit to the economy that the recovery from Harvey and Irma represents, that there will now sort of be this stimulative effort provoked by, yes, a tragedy, but at least now we get this kind of uh, economic boom that will come. And I, I um, wrote about the same thing years ago, the, the tsunami in Japan and, and uh, even post 9-11 recovery here in our own country. Anytime there's a, sort of this uh, major event, you get people coming out. Uh, in fairness, it's rooted in the flawed ideology of Keynesianism to begin with. But really, Bastiat in the 19th century and then the great Henry Hazlitt here in our 20th century, someone I began reading in middle school as his landmark book, Economics in One Lesson, blasted this way of thinking with what they termed the broken window fallacy. The idea that we would celebrate a hooligan throwing a brick through a window and saying, well, at least now the glass maker is going to get some business. And that's a good thing. And, and the fallacy in that broken window thinking is it ignores the, the tailor or the shoe cobbler who otherwise would have gotten the business that the, that the shop owner was going to use the money on. Now he's simply diverting the funds elsewhere. We don't celebrate a change in allocation of spending. We celebrate the creation of new wealth. That's what positive economics is. And, and the, the idea, I know that these people, by the way, are, do not mean this sadistically, and they do not mean it as um, a, a poor reflection of their view of humanity. This is really just limited to being terrible economics, but I guess that's sort of bad enough, don't you think? What you have here is a misunderstanding of the allocation of capital. Who in their right mind believes that the capital that's going to go into rebuilding the damage done from Hurricane Harvey, that that capital wanted to be spent on that? That the, that the um, whether it be government money or, or uh, private enterprise money, that rebuilding destroyed buildings and shops and things was their first use of funds. What's best for an economy is when the profit motive is driving an allocation of resources. So this idea 
Uh, this money has to be spent. We have a human tragedy that took place, and there needs to be a recovery for the residents, citizens, and communities affected. But the idea that this is something to be opportunistically seeing in the, in the context of uh, economics is itself a violation of Bastiat's 19th century broken window fallacy. I would think we would grow past that at some point. So some of the other areas that we, that we cover in this week's um, Dividend Cafe, I would, I would encourage you to look at. I know the video will go on too long if I read through all of it, but a lot on Europe, a lot on these global conditions um, where the euro as a currency lies right now against the dollar and why we believe there continues to be kind of an irreparable problem around the shared currency that will be a secular inhibitor of growth in Europe for a long time to come. Um, so I do, just because of time constraint, need to leave it there. But there's a lot of really interesting things happening right now, and I feel like these lulls in between earnings season, and frankly, it was a somewhat boring week in the market. I mean, we're up 300 points, 350 points as of right now in the market. We had a huge day on Monday. But there hasn't necessarily really been any huge um, North Korea activity, Trumpian activity, kind of the normal headline things. And earnings season from Q2 is done. Earnings season from Q3 hasn't started yet. So I am taking advantage of that time in terms of the content we create for you to just be a little bit more broadly informative. Delve into our thinking about Japan. Delve into our thinking about Europe. You know what we believe about bottom-up investing here in the United States. We see tremendous opportunity with certain companies that are growing their dividends that represent long-term value in a portfolio. We also see some companies that have done very well by us and our clients getting stretched in valuation and we're trimming profits a little there. Risk management's alive and well. We're a couple weeks away from our annual due diligence trip to New York City. Uh, myself and our managing director of analytics and solutions, uh, Dea Pernas, will be joining me. We have something in the vein of 30 meetings scheduled with key hedge funds, portfolio managers, and the asset management companies that we work with across all asset classes to gather and organize and challenge and review our perspective on, on uh, both macro and micro conditions. So it's a fun time of year, but um, I do really welcome your questions. Let me leave it there for now. Thanks for listening to Dividend Cafe.